All right, so I am going to be talking about how to make your website not ugly, which I think everyone can agree is a good thing. Yeah, okay. All right, so a little bit about me. I'm a former journalist. I know there's actually a lot of former journalists here. Thank, okay, yeah, I was kind of expecting some noise. <laughs> um, and I had a stint as a print designer. I've started doing a little bit of web design, but my background is primarily as a, a software developer. Um, 10 Forward Consulting in Madison. I also have, I was talking to somebody, we have, um, have some Guinan stickers because we're named for the bar and the enterprise. So if anybody wants a Guinan sticker, come find me afterwards. Uh, 10 Forward, we primarily work with startups. So a lot of times they don't have a budget for a designer or for us to do any kind of in-house design. And so this talk kind of originated because there was a lot of stuff that I knew we should be doing, but we didn't have anyone who had the existing knowledge, so I kind of had to figure it out myself. And then fun fact, I read the second book of the Stormlight Archive in one day, if anybody's a Brandon Sanderson fan. Yeah, it's uh, 1,088 pages. I took a, a day off of work <laughs> when I got it because I knew I wouldn't be able to put it down. All right, so we're gonna look at a real website from 1996. Right? Right, pretty attractive. Uh, this is a senator's website, by the way. This isn't just like some kid in their basement, like I was making a terrible website. Uh, this is like a congressional website. So who thinks that this is well designed? <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, this, this look is kind of like coming back a little bit, God forbid, but uh, right. I mean, most of us look at this and we, we realize, yeah, this could probably be improved. So the point of that is you know more than you think you do, right? So even if you don't have any design experience or wouldn't consider yourself creative, you can at least recognize when something could be improved or when it's, when it's really not working. But why do we care, right? Doesn't it matter more that what we're building works well? So usability is a big one. Um, it doesn't really matter if everything works well if people don't know how to find it, right? Credibility is another big one. So there was a study from Stanford University. They had 10 different categories and they asked people to rank the categories by which one they felt gave them the most trust in a website on first visit. 46% of people said the visual design was the most important. That was the, the uh, category that had the most votes. Functionality was only 8%. So especially when we're first coming to a site, we don't really care how it works because we haven't gotten there yet. We want to know, we want to be able to trust the website. And then interest is the last one. So this varies really widely depending on what study you look at, but it seems that it's from about 10 seconds to 50 milliseconds is how long we have to convince someone to stay on the site before they bounce. Some of you are thinking, okay, I'll buy it. I'm listening. Let's see what you have to say. Disclaimer, of course. There are always exceptions, right? So everything I'm gonna talk about today are sort of broad guidelines, depending on the site or application's target demographics, the intended use, you know, these are not going to necessarily apply. But they found, and so Nielsen Norm Group does a ton with UX, and they re revisited some of their major findings from like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, to see, does, is this still true? Does these still hold up? And they found that usability guidelines tend to be very durable. So the idea being that Design trends and patterns definitely change over time, but human behavior does not, as anyone who has dated an ill-suited partner knows all too well. So, we got a lot to cover. I'm gonna speak pretty fast because I have a lot of things I wanna get out and I don't have a ton of time, um, but you can follow along. I have my slides up online and I'll have that link at the bottom and I'll have it later, so. All right, so first we're gonna look at words and how we think about text as like a visual element. Then images, when do we use them, what kind do we use, how do we use them in the right way? And then design as kind of an overall picture, how do we think about design from a logical perspective? All right, first, we wanna make speech visual. So there was this 28, two, sorry, 2008 eye tracking study and they found that visitors only read 20% of text contact on, content on average. So how can we improve that? First, we wanna make sure that our text can breathe. So length, again, depending on what study you look at, there's a lot of different opinions about this, but broadly speaking, 
people prefer line lengths that are shorter, so 50, 60 characters per line, but they actually read faster at longer lengths. So the New York Times, for example, which I use them for a lot of examples in here, I mean, they're a site that's literally meant for people to be reading giant blocks of text. And they keep their line length at right around like 75. So kind of anywhere between 60 and 100 is fine, again, depending on what part of the site it is, but going longer than 100, people start to, they don't follow all the way to the end of the line. Uh, line height, we usually do about 1.4. Again, this depends on what your typeface is. Um, this is not 1.4 pixels or EMs, it's 1.4 times the font size of the element. And that tends to, you know, again, generally speaking, that works really well. And then padding, so we do at least like 15 pixels because especially if you have like columns of text, if the columns are too close, people just read straight across. Um, if they're too far away, people get to the end and they don't know where they're supposed to go next. So just making sure that you have ample space around your text so that it, it's easy to follow the flow of what you're trying to do. So here's an example of maybe not how to do it. Um, you know, the lines are really close together. You can see that the text from the different lines are actually touching each other. Um, it's really wide. I just look at this and I immediately want to go check out something else. And here's how they actually do it. So this again is from the Times. So there's plenty of spacing, but it doesn't feel like there are gaps. We can see that long column of white on the side. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but like white space is your friend. It is not wasted. All right, and then it has to be legible. So contrast. Um, there's a great website that I always check all of my color combinations on. Um, it's webaim.org. They have a contrast checker, and it checks with the WCAG standards, so making sure that it's, it's compliant with accessible standards. And this is important because just because you can read something doesn't mean that everyone can read it, right? I think about one in 10 people in the US have some kind of um, disability, and that's a lot of people. And so a very easy way to make it easier for folks to consume your content is to just make sure that it's, the contrast is good. Size, uh, 16 pixels is the browser default for a reason, especially as we have an aging population who maybe is having you know, vision issues. Like It's really important that your text is not too small. And again, this depends on the typeface. So we just redesigned, we're redesigning our site and some of our text, we actually put the default at 20 because it just tends to be a smaller, more condensed typeface. So, who can read this? Oh, come on. I want your eyesight. I, I clearly could not read that. And then we have here, right? And this still would not pass those, those standards for accessibility, but it's way better. All right, so then we want to make our text scannable. So, like we said earlier, that study from 2008, people only read about 20% of text content. Um, we, we lose people very quickly when it's a text-heavy page. And so making sure that they are able to scan through everything will allow us to keep people longer. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in the presentation. Some ways to do this, highlight the key content um, using subheads. And this I thought was really interesting. We actually read faster when text has a mix of uppercase and lowercase letters. And it's not because that inherently is easier to read. We're just trained to read that. And so when we see all caps or all lowercase, it actually takes us, you know, split seconds longer to be able to process that content. Below this, another great way to do it. So this is the site where I just kind of stripped out a lot of their styling. And if I come here, I just see a giant block of text. I don't really know what it's about. I have to, I know that I have to invest at least a few minutes to figure out what they're even talking about, to see if I'm interested in it. And this is what it actually looks like. So we can see it's very clear what the title is, right? That grabs my attention immediately. They have keywords at the top, so I can look at the keywords and see, okay, am I interested in this? Is this worth my time? They pull out the first paragraph and make it bigger. They have subheads, so maybe I see, okay, I know a little bit about people scanning websites, but maybe there's something new in here that I don't know about, so I'm gonna skim through the subheads, see if one catches my eye. Oh, I didn't know about you know, this new study. Let me read that paragraph. All right. Keep decoration to a minimum. So this is something that I think is, is, it's more tempting to not do this, as there are so many different, you know, like Google Fonts, there are so many different free typefaces that we can use. Um, and it's, it's easy, especially for like clients that we work with, to be like, oh, we want like six different typefaces. It's like, no, not gonna do that, and here's why. Uh, 
we usually pick like two or three. So maybe we have one typeface that's dedicated to our headers and subheaders and one that's for body text. Colors again, so two to three. And the reason for this is because when you have too many typefaces or too many colors, our brain instinctively assumes that it's an ad. And we just completely skip that. We don't even look at that content. We just skip it completely. So again, kind of using more complex fonts or typefaces for the headers where the text is probably bigger and then your simpler ones for the body text which is probably gonna be a little bit smaller. So I'm not making fun of this website and actually I felt much better about using this example in this presentation because I saw that they redesigned it and it's much better now. But this is what it used to look like. And when I look at that site, I, first of all, I don't know where to go because there's a lot of different elements that are competing for my attention. The nav is in kind of an unusual spot. That's not where I would instinctively go to look for navigation. I assumed that all of those squares at the bottom were ads because they all have different typefaces, the colors are all different, the font size is all different, and those are actually just like pages on the site. They're like programs that the church has. So this is a better example. Like every time that I go to this slide, I just kind of like, oh, yes, this is just nice. It's very clear, the navigation is where I expect it to be. It's clear what page I'm on. I know what pattern, I know at a glance, what pattern this site is using to disseminate information. And a big thing that I'm gonna talk about is how you wanna make people learn one pattern and stick to it, right? We wanna make using our application or website as painless as possible. Okay, we're gonna recap quick. So we wanna think about speech as a visual element within a website or application. So give it plenty of breathing room, make sure it's legible, make it scannable so that people can skip around to what they're interested in and keep it simple. Not too many colors or too many typefaces. All right. We wanna use our images appropriately. And really, I don't think there's any situation where this image is not appropriate. <laughs> but that's another conversation. So, icons. Uh, a company that's actually called user testing, which is a little too on the nose, but they studied 190 icons in 2015. And they asked people what, they asked people to predict what would happen when they clicked on a particular icon. So they found that if they gave them icons that were unique to an application, so for example, Twitter has the little like feather thing that you click if you want to write a message. That one everybody knows, but you know, icons like that that are unique to a specific application. If they didn't have a label, only 34% of people knew what it was going to do. So that's like a third of people. So 66% of people guess wrong. If they use more generic, universal icons, again, without a label, 60% of people guessed what it was gonna do correctly. And if they put a label on those more generic icons, then 80% of people got it right. But that's still, you know, one-fifth people didn't know what was gonna happen when they clicked that icon. So the idea is kind of there are maybe three, like, truly universal icons. It just doesn't exist. And especially if you have an application that is used by an international audience, I mean, you just, you cannot assume that people know what something is gonna do. So, oh, too fast. Um, so yeah, labels are the rule, not the exception. They work best often in a navigation or a menu setting. That's kind of, again, where we expect them as well. Or if they're, if you use them for decoration, not as part of the actual like, functionality. And then avoiding icons with conflicting meanings. So I want everyone to think, what icon would you choose to mean share? Give people a second. Okay. These are all icons that have been used in software to mean share. They all look completely different from each other. Some of them, I really don't understand why they went that particular route, but that just kind of goes to show, right? There, there really are very few universal icons. And you know, some people have come up to me after this talk and be like, well, what if we put hover text on it? Well, hover text doesn't work on mobile, for one. Um, and also, that is creating extra work for the user, right? And we wanna make it easy for people to interact with our content. So if I, have to, if I have to put invisible work into understanding how something works, I'm already just, you know, irate by that experience and not really having a good time with it. All right, so then images. Um, who has heard of banner blindness? Couple people, okay. So this is back in the days when I was building my Buffy the Vampire Slayer website. And pretty much all sites had that like flashing rectangular ad right at the top. Do you remember that? That was so ubiquitous that we started to instinctively ignore that section. And we'll see that again in a little bit. 
We just literally don't even look there. Now, kind of realizing this, this banner blindness, people have started to put their, their ads elsewhere, right? So how many times when you're reading through like a news article and then it says like content continues after the ad and there's just an ad right in the middle of the text, right? That's kind of the new, one of the new patterns. But we skip that too now. I find that I notice what that is and I just don't even look at it. I just skip down to the rest of the text. So we, we adjust for the patterns of ad placements. So this ties into you know, basic UX because you want to be aware of that, right? So don't put key content in these areas that we expect to be ads because we literally don't see them. We just skip right past it. Make sure that your images, are inter inter images or graphics are integrated with your content, right? So if, if something is clearly a stock photo, that brings down credibility. If it seems not related to the content, we again kind of assume it's an ad. Um, and it's just distracting. So, so News and Norman Group, they found that the first thing that users are drawn to on a website is actually plain text, then faces. So if you had, like one of our clients had a blog and they kept wanting us to put more images into their blog, just for the sake of having images. Like, oh, we just want to break up the text, let's put some images in. And we had to come back and argue, like, just getting a random stock image of a flag, like, actually detracts from your content. Right? That makes it look more like an ad. That doesn't make people want to read it. So making sure that our images are informative and or relevant. Right? So maybe it's a picture of the company team or someone using the app or like a workflow image. You know, something that is actually related to the text that ties it together instead of being distracting. <laughs> people have maybe seen this before. This one's pretty popular. Um, they have also redone their website a little bit. If you go to uh, lingscars.com, it's a little better. Um, I stuck with the old one because it's worse and also because they now have a, a little graphic on the top that says that even with that terrible website, they're still like the number one best-selling car dealer in the UK, which is true. They're like very successful. Um, but I think they, you know, this is the exception that proves the rule. It's just very distracting. I'm not entirely sure what they're doing because you don't really see any cars here. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe, maybe not where we want to go. On the other hand, this kind of ticks off all those boxes, right? The content, it might be a stock image, but at least it's very related to the content of the article. It's integrated directly because we have the title going over the image so we can see that they are connected, they are part of the same thing. It's not like a standalone where we might expect it to be an ad. Um, and it's simple, it's effective. All right, so another recap. We want to think about speech from a visual perspective, right? So how do we make sure that we can read it, that it has enough space, that it's easy for people to, to connect with? We want to use our images appropriately, so icons should like seriously always have a label. Uh, one thing I like to do if I'm going to use an icon, especially a unique icon for an application, is I go around to everyone in my office, show them the icon, ask them, you know, within the context of the app, like, what do you think this does? And if they don't all give me the correct answer, then I don't use it. I go back to the drawing board. Right, seven to ten. We're going to think logically about our design the same way we think logically about anything else that we do. So, patterns. Patterns are your best friend. Um, if you are, so for example, something that happens a lot in our office is we have an existing site that maybe we had a designer come and do or we use a template or, you know, whatever the case is, and the client wants to add a new page. And so we end up building that page from scratch and we just base it off the existing design. So we look, okay, well, what are the patterns that we've been using already, right? Do we have a certain kind of column that we like to use? Do we have, like, colored banners that go all the way across that we can use? Uh, one thing that our, our, uh, a designer friend of mine said once was, like, there are literally a billion websites, so just find one you like and kind of copy it. Because for the most part, what we're doing, you know, again, this is where that sort of, like, well, not all websites. Um, if you're building something that, that needs to have a unique design, it needs to be really trendy and eye-catching, like, obviously, you want to do something unique. But in, the most ca in most cases, we just want something that looks good. So quality trumps originality in most cases. Find something that works, use it as a model, right? Just focus on the patterns and making sure everything is consistent, right? That idea of like teaching our user one pattern, sticking to it so that it's very easy for them to navigate through the site or application, find what they're looking for. 
So this is actually one of my favorite bars in Madison. This is their old site, they got a new one, but they keep a link to the, keep the old one up for like nostalgia. Uh, but this was their real website until maybe a year ago. And it's completely useless, right? I know nothing about the bar. I have no idea how old those St. Patty's Day pictures are because they've been up there forever. Um, weird things are highlighted, weird things are bolded, they have multiple colors. Some things that are underlined aren't actually links. It's just kind of a hot mess. Here, on the other hand, we have, I mean, it's, this is like just patterns, right? Everything is in patterns. We have our columns, we have our navigation on the side, we can see the filters, everything is structured the same, the squares are all the same size. It's very easy to come to this, having never used it before, and be able to find what you want. All right, who's heard of progressive disclosure? Couple people, okay. So progressive disclosure is the idea of not overwhelming users with content, but making it easy for them to find what they're looking for. So we're gonna talk about some ways to do that. Who is familiar with the F-shape reading pattern? More people, okay. So this is one of those ones I mentioned earlier, the durability of usability guidelines, and this is one that they went and revisited, I think it was 20 years later, and they found that it's still true. Um, so it's this, right? The red is where we spend the most time, looking at a site, and then the blue and clear is where we spend the least time. So we can see there's this sort of broad F shape. So we start in the top, I don't know, left and right, left corner, and then we kind of cascade down. And again, you can see that the intensity of, of our consumption of content drastically like, tapers off the farther down that we get. They found that for languages that are flipped from English, so where you read the opposite direction, the F-shape pattern is still there, it's just flipped, kind of like you would expect. So this is, this is kind of a, a universal um, behavior. So top to bottom, important to less important, right? They found that, um, in 2014, they found that 156% more people see, you know, sort of like above the fold. So newspapers, the above the fold was literally above the fold, right? If you were holding a physical newspaper in your hands, they put the eye-catching stuff at the top because they wanted you to be invested enough that you would bother to actually open the newspaper. And that same behavior, right, human behavior does not change. We just ported that behavior over to the web. But instead of a fold, we have a scroll. So it's kind of like before the scroll. So 156% more people look at the content before the scroll. So we wanna make sure that we are, we are drawing people at the top, so really getting our, our key concepts at the top of the page, and then avoid putting content in those traditional ad areas. So if we go back to look at here, right, we can see that we don't even look at the top, for the most part, that whole top section, we don't even look at. Um, part of that is banner blindness, part of that is that we now kind of expect that a navigation is there, and when we first get to a site, we're not necessarily interested in the navigation, right? We wanna figure out, well, what are they about? Do I care? And if I care, then maybe I wanna go click for something specific. So here's a good example, right? Again, from the New York Times. So we can see that in that area that we don't look at, they just put other stories. And it's like, yeah, if we click on those, great. If we don't, not the end of the world. They have a nice big title. I know exactly what this is about. The image is like, very relevant to the content. <laughs> I have subheads, so I can kind of scroll through, see what I'm looking for. They understand that, you know, and you can see there's almost an F on this page, right? They, they understand the way that we are going to interact with the content, and so they just have a whole bunch of white space there because we're not looking there anyway. Like, why bother putting something there? All right, so again with consistency, right? If there's one thing you leave with, today, it's that consistency and patterns in design are like your best friend. So, links and buttons, right? If a button has a shadow one place, it should probably have a shadow all the time. Forms should have the same color. If you have like alerts, the red should be the same color. Um, tables should look the same. Your header typefaces and sizes should be the same. And now, you know, we have some sites where that are very, very data heavy. So like for the university. So they're just literally looking at data from research projects, and so tables for like one category might have like a different color for the header, right? So that they can use that as a visual cue to see what they're looking at, but otherwise everything is the same because we wanna make it, again, we wanna make it easy for people to find what they're looking for. So which 
part of this text do you think is the link? Is it the green or is it the underline? Yeah, no one answered because like you have no way of knowing unless you click on something. Is it, you know, is the green maybe where you hover and it gives you that sort of weird definition or it wants you to click somewhere else to go somewhere? I look at this and I have to stop and think. And what I don't want is to think about how the content works. I want to, you know, ideally I'm thinking about the content itself and like, you know, it's thoughtful and deep and whatever. But I don't want to think about how to interact with it. So functionality is a part of design. The structure, so I'm a full stack developer, so I do back end and Rails and then front end. And on a new project, or even if I'm just adding to the architecture of an existing product, I think about how the data models can have a direct impact on the user facing implementation. So I sit there and I think, okay, what am I likely building out on the front end in the interface that someone's gonna use? How can I make sure that I am sort of preparing for that to be a, you know, like a cooperative, I was gonna say venture, which is like kind of a business phony word, but you know what I mean. Like how can I think about how they work together? Um, bugs trump beauty, right? So we saw that 46% of people think that visual design is the most important for building credibility versus 8% for functionality. But if you decide to stay on a site because of the visual design and then the links are all broken and the forms don't submit, you're not gonna stay anyway, right? So this, I really like this quote, um, design is where science and art break even. So the idea that, you know, I think a lot of people, when they hear visual design, they think that it's, it's not really, you know, especially if you're more of a backend programmer, but they think it's not really relevant to what I'm doing, right? The code is one thing, the visual design is another thing, but they all fit together and impact each other. And, and if we're aware of that, then we can like really build kick-ass shit. All right, final recap. So we wanna think about our words as a visual construct, right? How do we make sure that they're able to be read easily and quickly? Images, icons should always have labels. Photos and graphics should be integrated with the content, relevant, informative. Stock images are not your friend because we look at text first, that's what we're drawn to, then we look at faces. Random flag pictures are just like, whatever. And then how do we think about design from a logical perspective, right? So using patterns and being consistent, keeping in mind that F-shaped reading pattern and how that affects where we put what content, um, being consistent, and then of course making sure that it works. So some additional information. I have a bunch of citations that you can check out for where I got all this information. And that's all I have, so thank you. <laughs>